Hi, I'm KempDog, and welcome to the ranking of all the Ace Attorney cases from worst to best. My brother and I have been huge Ace Attorney fans for years. We love talking to each other and analyzing all these cases, and I really wanted to be able to discuss this kind of stuff in more detail instead of going through comment sections. So that's why this video exists. The world can never have enough Ace Attorney discussion, you know? But this isn't just gonna be like any other countdown video. I brought my brother along on this video so that way we can have some back and forth discussion. Hey, I'm the Wonky Angle or 256Pi anywhere else on YouTube. He's voicing Phoenix, I'm voicing Edgeworth, and uh, yeah, we're just rolling with that. So before we begin, we should set some ground rules. First of all, this entire video is just an opinion. None of this is set in stone. It's just how we feel. Heck, we don't even fully agree on it ourselves. We went through a full year and a half of replaying every case and negotiating between each other to nail everything down. It's worth noting that we tend to look at this entire series from the perspective of them being visual novels. If some gameplay mechanics are annoying, we'll bring it up, but it usually won't be a make or break thing. Replay value is also a big factor that played into how we put it all together. This comes from the perspective of people who've played every game in the series multiple times each. We'll rate a case higher if we want to come back to it more, or lower if we don't feel like coming back to it as much. This will cover the original trilogy, the second trilogy of Apollo Justice, Dual Destinies, and Spirit of Justice, and both of the Investigations games starring Edgeworth. It does not include DGS or The Great Ace Attorney because we haven't played it, and it doesn't include Professor Layton vs. Phoenix Wright, which we have played, but we didn't include it because it doesn't play into as much of an episodic format and didn't feel like it did. Also, this should go without saying, but SPOILER WARNING for all of these cases! We're basically going through these assuming you've played all the games we have. If you haven't, then just go do that now. Whatever we may say about these cases going forward, we also believe that none of them are skippable and all of them are worth the effort of playing through. This ranking is more about what cases most make us want to come back and replay over and over. So let's not waste any more time. Let's get right into it. Number 20. I21. Turnabout Target. So welcome to the top half, and let's start with a case that has no right being as great as it is. All the intro cases may be gathered at the bottom, but there are two major exceptions. One we'll get to later, and this one. We talked about Dual Destinies starting with a bang, but it's nothing compared to this intro. No way to establish how much Investigations 2 means business than starting with a freaking presidential assassination. Well, a fake assassination attempt, but also happens to involve Shelley to kill her dressed as an ice cream salesman. Enough said. This case may only be an intro case, but it's easily the longest and meatiest of all the intro cases. It's got more substance than even some second cases in other games, about as much as Turnabout Airline maybe. It's a fairly quick case, easy to come back to and replay, but the stakes are instantly raised really high and the challenge is established right away. You're also introduced to one of the best mechanics in the series, Edgeworth's Logic Chess. Tripping up witnesses in their own words is a ton of fun, even when you're going up against Diet Lotta Heart. And for what it's worth, the characters that appear in this case are plenty of fun and already have more flavor and interesting design than most of the characters from Investigations 1. Horace Knightley, for instance, is just so much more instantly memorable than nearly all the characters from the last game. His crazy mohawk and neck injury, his constant gun twirling and obsession with chess, even his immediate threat as a villain that might not even reveal itself right away. The president with his giant body, lion hair, and imposing, screaming, over-the-top voice. He seems like a threat, but he's really a massive coward and a fat ass who faked an assassination as a ploy to make himself look stronger to his country. And Tommy may have made a crack at Nicole Swift, but even she's pretty well done too. The way she gets directly tied up in the plot and they get you to care about her. Also Payne was there and he got a laser pointed at him. Yep. Not much else to say about this one. There may be other cases that have a lot more meat on their bones and deliver a lot more interesting stuff, but it's very rare for an Ace Attorney game to start firing on all cylinders so quickly. And we really gotta give it credit for pulling you in immediately. For what it is, it exceeds all expectations. <laughs> Number 19, I-24, The Forgotten Turnabout. Okay, time to get into the case where Edgeworth willingly gives up his prosecutor's badge and Kay Faraday loses all her memories and becomes almost a completely different person. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good metric for this case's importance. Even in one of its weaker moments, Investigations 2 is still kicking ass. 
The setting is really cool too. Everything taking place in this big skyscraper and the faux church courtroom of the PIC hearing room, it's really fun to look around. A lot of heart shows up and is just as enjoyable as always. Franziska comes back and we get to see the best repeatedly whipped, which is immensely satisfying. Ema Sky even has a more active cameo where she follows you around a bit and does some luminol stuff. Still kind of wish she had more to do here, but eh, whatever. And the whole amnesia thing with Kay may be kind of cliched, but it's pretty interesting to see Kay in this totally different state. It's pretty cool insight into how her mind works and some of her usual personality does occasionally show through her interactions. I was also expecting to talk about how I felt like this case dragged on too long for its own good. It is a bit of a recurring problem with investigations too that these cases are excessively long. But the length mostly felt warranted here. It was pretty well paced and the stakes are consistently built really well. Honestly, the biggest problem that came to mind was I just don't like this one nurse character, Karen Jensen. She and her grandmother, Coroner Bonnie Young, basically make up a comedy duo setup, which feels weirdly off and not particularly funny. The grandma I don't mind too much, her sassy attitude and needing to whisper pure snark for her granddaughter to read out is kind of funny, I guess. But Karen just rubs me the wrong way for some reason. She's a bit overly cheery and doesn't have much variety in facial expressions, aside from her image of her grandma. Even when it's revealed that she's actually really plot important and was blackmailed into doing a whole bunch of cover-up stuff for the killer, she just kinda has the same dumb look on her face as if she's not taking things seriously. Kind of a Lauren Pops-ish effect, though not nearly as bad since she doesn't look like she's only pretending to care, she just looks totally oblivious. I also don't love Blaze the best as the villain. He doesn't have much of a personality outside of generic mob boss type villain, and his ending every sentence with you know you see, you know you see got pretty annoying, but I, I won't deny that he is legit really intimidating. No kidding. You basically have to catch him twice with him admitting his crime to your face after some particularly intense logic chess. And then you have to actually prove everything at the PIC hearing. He's basically Quirk as Alba done right. And his presence also leads to the first time you properly feel sympathy for Sebastian DeBest, who was previously just an annoying waste of time. It's shown that his dad is just a massive dick to his face, and somehow he still tries to win his respect. And when Edward is talking about the killer having a burn mark on his face and Blaze denying it, Sebastian is immediately the first one to notice he's lying. Also, random side note, but I like how much they've developed the victim Jill Crane in this case, the way she's actually a pretty badass investigator who's out to get revenge on Blaze and expose him for what he really is, is surprisingly well prepared and even almost survives getting murdered. Just a nice extra detail to be thrown in there. But I think one of the best elements of this case is actually Judge Courtney. Seeing Edwards relinquish his badge because he feels it's preventing him from exposing the truth eventually gets her to question her own motivations and finally just completely turn on her own boss and become actually helpful to you. It's an absolutely awesome moment. This case is just all around pretty solid, but there's a bunch more cases that we think are even better and just pop out to us more. Like the next one, which you wouldn't think would pop out so much, but certainly does in its own way. Number 18. I-14, Turnabout Reminiscence. The only case from Investigations 1 in the top half of the ranking. Yeah, this is a pretty great case. It's not without its flaws. The case taking place in the courthouse and getting to look through the other rooms should be a cool setting, but isn't actually that interesting. It's all colorless and bland and not visually appealing. Not to mention there's big chunks of this case dedicated to some very long info dump segments that are pretty boring. All the talk of the KG-8 incident especially is just very difficult to give a crap about. One of the victims is even called Dead Man, like, come on, they weren't even trying. But I will have to say, unlike the other cases in Investigations 1, the stuff that's actually good in the case gives us more to say than the stuff that isn't. The good definitely outweighs the bad here. This case is great because you get to see a bunch of backstory for characters we've already known for a while. How Gumshoe first met Edgeworth, and how he became so loyal to him, how Kay Faraday knew who both of them were. You get to see her as a 10 year old, and the way she makes such good friends with Gumshoe is absolutely adorable. And speaking of adorable, you get to see Franziska as a 13 year old, and she's literally exactly the same as any other time we've seen her personality wise. But it's really something to see all this hyper competitiveness out of her still as a little kid. And we get to see Manfred von Karma briefly in the beginning, which I think is kind of cool because he's actually on your side. It's interesting to actually see the good in him at least a little bit. Another thing I like is the new characters. 
which isn't something Investigations 1 has been great at either. But there's only two here. Detective Bad may seem like a typical hard-boiled detective type who's seen everything and is super serious and a pro at his job, but he's not nearly as mean as he looks. Where his gun should be is a mirror, and what looks like a cigarette is just a lollipop, both of which were pretty funny reveals. He's even great with kids. He gets along really well with Kay. And Kalisto Yu, he's really enjoyable because she basically acknowledges just how absolutely ridiculous 20-year-old Edgeworth looks and has no qualms about literally laughing in his face about how posh and stuck up he is. And it doesn't hurt that she even turns out to be a compellingly intimidating villain. Turns out her ability to laugh off her and other people's misfortune so easily is a hint that she's a psychopath. But we all know the real most important part of this case. It's not Gumshoe or Francisca or Kay or Bad, it's the fact that one of the witnesses is the freaking judge. And it's just as amazing as it sounds. You get to question him about seeing Gumshoe from a- uh, <laughs> You get to question him about seeing Gumshoe from the bathroom. And pointing out flaws in his testimony and him being absolutely overexcited about everything is just the best. You get to not allow him to not allow you to make an objection. <laughs> <laughs> Investigations 1 may as well be worth it for this appearance alone, but thankfully the rest of this case is plenty to enjoy around it to make it still fun to come back to. Great case, if only the rest of the game were on this level. Number 17 5-6, Turnabout Reclaimed I think the word that would best describe Turnabout Reclaimed would be adorable? or maybe wholesome, that seems more apt. Not words you would necessarily attach to a murder series, but that's what we got. And I kinda love it. This case is of course Phoenix Wright's grand return to court, and his first case as a lawyer in eight years. So naturally, his first move is to defend a whale. A literal whale is your defendant. Even by the standards of this series, that's pretty freaking ridiculous, if not altogether surprising. Now aside from the fact that this case takes place chronologically between cases 2 and 3 of this game and needs to be played in that spot to work the best, which is weird, but okay, this is one of those cases that may as well come off as a complete joke from start to finish. And the fact that all the hints at dark secrets for every single character turn out to not be particularly dark at all, it's like the one case where the least amount of bad things happen, which doesn't necessarily help matters. The whale defendant's just the tip of the iceberg. You also get to meet a vet with a penguin in his hair, a scrawny pirate-themed rapper who later drinks an entire barrel of steroids and becomes very much not scrawny, and most ridiculous of all, an author who is apparently famous enough to have the attitude of an egotistical movie director. How did you get to that level writing books, lady? <laughs> and the ridiculousness extends beyond the characters themselves, not just cross-examining the whale and faking out the judge into thinking you're gonna cross-examine the whale, but also quite a bit of time is dedicated towards analyzing two freaking pirate songs, one of which is terrible, and the other of which is much better but also a near unkillable earworm. And if the case wasn't cutesy and lighthearted enough as is, Pearl Faye returns and has a non-unsubstantial role and her personality is pretty much exactly the same as it was when she was an eight-year-old. Maybe a little worrying in and of itself, but yeah, this is like the smiliest and happiest case in this entire series, and that tone is especially off-putting if you play it right after the game's finale. Don't do that, take our word for it, between 5-2 and 5-3. Though make no mistake, as ridiculous and lighthearted as Turnabout Reclaimed is, they definitely get you to care about all these characters. Sasha Buckler, for instance, is so likable and sincere and always wanting to see everyone else happy, to the point of even hiding a heart condition that it well makes up for the cringy fish puns. Even those as much as they fall flat, you have to appreciate her making the effort. Dr. Crab is the embodiment of true neutral. He just always refuses to take sides on things, though he also takes his job very seriously. Kick the witness stand seriously. Norma de Plume? Okay, maybe her attitude is a little obnoxious, but she's far from the most annoying this series has to offer. She becomes more likable as you go on, since she's determined to use her platform for good. Replace JK Rowling for this woman any day. And of course Marlon Rhymes, aside from his working off of Pearl surprisingly well, and just the fact that the Dissin of Phoenix Wright is probably the best name for a testimony in the whole series, has to be one of the most likable killers we've ever met. If you even want to call him a killer, because he really wasn't one at all. 
He may have been trying to kill the orca over a misunderstanding where he thought it killed his girlfriend, but he obviously didn't succeed and the actual victim only slipped and fell to his death. Rhymes even tried to save his life. I mean, yeah, the steroid barrel thing was pretty stupid, but you really can't help but like this guy. This is just all around a super enjoyable case from start to finish. The comedy is top notch, it's got plenty of heart, it's super colorful and visually appealing, it's even just the right difficulty level. Not nearly as handholdy as something like Monstrous Turnabout, while also not nearly as hard to follow. You can get stuck in this one several times, but never feel like this game's being cheap. As much of a joke as Turnabout Reclaimed is, it's too fun to fall into the bottom half. And on the topic of surprisingly replayable lighthearted cases... Number 16. 4-2. Turnabout Corner. Alright, finally, let's talk about some more Apollo Justice. It may seem kinda anti-climax to follow up one of the most insane intro cases in the entire series with a fairly lighthearted case like this one, but I think it fits pretty well, all things considered. As bright and colorful as it is, it's still a case that likes to focus on the gray areas in all characters, how nobody is truly as good or evil as they may seem. You have to deal with gangsters who are responsible members of society, and one of which, your client, is an edgy teenager who wants to be Snoop Dogg, but instead comes off as furry vanilla ice. And at the same time, the victim is a doctor who covered up a mistake from the mob and tried to kill someone himself. You're hired by an innocent looking young woman who actually turns out to be a massive gold digger and even the real killer giving off slight disingenuous vibes a la Lauren Pops, but actually on purpose and done well. Oh, and the super pretentious educated college student witness is really a massive perv. Sure, dude, you stole lots of women's panties so that you could discover the secret behind Trucy's magic trick. Sure, thank you for making this case the panties case, that is all your fault. Really the only fully reasonable side character around here is the pissy noodle shop owner, who is also an out-of-work surgeon, he's cool. <laughs> but it's the main characters that get this case up as high as it is. Not so much Phoenix, who is there to be a dick to Apollo, and get hit by a car so hard he barely gets injured at all, and doesn't impact the plot in any way, or Apollo himself, who literally everyone else in this case consistently treats like dirt. The guy just cannot cut a break in this one. But more importantly, this case is our first taste of Clavier Gavin, who may not do that much compared to Turnabout Serenade, but still leaves an impact immediately, not just through his constant air guitaring and possibly blasting his music while presenting his case, but also because he's a great change of pace from all these prosecutors who are immediately antagonistic to you. He's just there to find the truth, and is even openly friendly from the beginning. And he works great off the newly returned older version of Ema Sky, who is absolutely amazing. She absolutely hates his guts, heck, she kinda hates her life and the fact that he's a detective when she wanted to become a forensics expert. Not sure how failing her forensics tests got her into a higher rank, but whatever. I bet Gumshoe recommended her. But yeah, even despite being so much grumpier than before, she does eventually get along with you well, and she loves her forensics minigames as much as always. We've always greatly preferred this version of her personality over her earlier appearances in 1-5 and Investigations. She's fine in those, but she has a lot more character and enjoyability in the sequel trilogy. And of course, we really get to know Trucy in this case. She works great off of Apollo and everyone else right away. She's a ton of fun and even kind of scary sometimes. She kidnaps herself at one point in this case. Not to mention, she even figures out big plot details faster than Apollo. She just steals the spotlight from him for a minute to point out a big contradiction and explain what it means for you. Oh yeah, and she also teaches you the perceivability. This isn't everyone's favorite game mechanic, having to focus in on people's nervous twitches would be really tedious if you haven't played the game as much as we have and already know where you need to look ahead of time. But it's still pretty dang cool. I really like the music and that swirling background. In the 3DS version, it looks like it's being drawn with chalk or something. But yeah, overall, while it is still kind of best known as the panties case, we really don't have much negative to say about it. It's really visually appealing, all the characters are enjoyable, it's lots of fun to come back to, it's just a really solid case all around. Pretty underrated. <laughs> Number 15. 5-4. The Cosmic Turnabout. It's Ace Attorney. In SPACE! Yes! SPACE! It's the best at SPACE! 
Anyway, this case is entirely set up for Dual Destiny's true finale, Turnabout for Tomorrow. So much so that the two cases are basically just one and the same, and it's pretty hard to talk about them separately, or even think about them separately. But we're still gonna try. This case shows Apollo defending astronaut and personal hero Solomon Starbuck, accused of both murdering Apollo's best friend and fellow astronaut Clay Terran, as well as bombing his own rocket. The trial is interrupted by the explosion from the intro case, and Phoenix has to pick up from where Apollo left off, even though Apollo would rather that not happen. Yeah, this case is all set up in foreshadowing, but nearly every moment shows Apollo or Phoenix looking at the case and the truth being the opposite of what he initially thought. It looks like Starbuck is carrying Clay through the corridor, but it's the other way around. It looks like Yuri Cosmos came in from one entrance, but he came in from the other side and circled all the way around. It looks like Starbuck and Clay came out of one launch pad, but the launch pads freaking switched places. For a setup case, it's pretty nuts, and the game's finale doesn't work as well without all the open questions this case leaves that somehow get even more insane answers later. As for the characters, Starbuck and Yuri Cosmos are pretty much all comic relief, and it can be a bit hit and miss. Starbuck's constant depressed sighing can get a bit much, especially when he does it multiple times in succession. <laughs> the once you do get him back on the topic of SPACE, you can snap him out of it instantly. Yeah, I do think just the idea of a depressed astronaut is funny in of itself. But then there's Yuri Cosmos, who is constantly hilarious. This big self-important guy who drives around on a freaking Segway. Always bigging himself up and bragging and naming everything after space. Are you perchance the space police? The man I saw was in fact an earthling. And of course once you get him on the stand, he lies like 50 times and spins around at high speed and crashes into a wall like a Looney Tunes episode. The finale shows why he had to lie so many times. He does actually know what he's doing here and his hands were pretty tied, but here he just looks like a nut job. You saying he's not a nut job anyway? Well, more of a nut job. But never mind that. This case's strongest asset is the foreshadowing for what's to come in the finale like Athena being almost too familiar with the Space Center, which is a ton of fun to investigate, by the way. Or talking with Fulbright, who is weirdly way more cooperative than he usually is. Or Blackwell somehow several times more aggressive than he would be otherwise. Which is saying something. But two scenes in particular really stick out in that way. There's one scene near the end of the investigation where you talk with Aura Blackwell, and you get to see her act insanely bitter towards the entire legal system abuse robots, and even recognize Athena. It's some of the most tense stuff you've ever seen. But then it gets even more tense when Apollo returns to the office, clearly very pissed off the loss of his best friend and doing a pretty bad job of pretending to be fine. Suspicious of Athena, but never mentioning it, and even more bitter at Phoenix, and not trusting him at all to finish the case in the right way, because of that whole evidence forging thing that happened and he basically just quits entirely. And at the very end, we get the cliffhanger to end all cliffhangers. Athena herself getting some pretty decisive evidence pointed towards her as the killer. Now that's a freaking ending. This case is still only preparing you for the insanity to come, and oh boy, we will get to that near the end of this ranking. But Cosmic Turnabout still holds up as a lot of fun by itself and instantly makes you want to play the next one. But there is another case of Dual Destinies that's better than this one by itself, while also being much more self-contained. Number 14. Five, three, Turnabout Academy. Look, I think we all know the main reason this case is up so high in the ranking is because it's the only full-length case in the series so far where you get to play as Athena Sykes. She's just as much of an absolute joy to follow around as you'd expect, both really funny and really emotionally investing, and she has the best objection theme in the series. This alone is a huge boost for this case. She seriously needs a full game focused on her at some point. There is still the actual case though. While it does kind of carry over a few issues from the monstrous turnabout, most notably in that it is pretty convoluted and not easy to follow. It's at least not nearly as handholdy or rigidly linear in its construction. By this point, the game assumes you know what you're doing and even has its fair share of pretty challenging moments that I could get stuck on. There are other issues too, like its focus on all the anime tropes played straight, be it the whole power of friendship thing, or just the fact that the case takes place at a freaking high school, how original, 
And they do really smash the whole Dark Age of the Law thing in your face too much. I mean, you got a teacher there whose motto is the end justifies the means, says it like 50 billion times and tries to pass it on to his students, constantly butting heads with the victim who's all about finding the truth, and shockingly that guy turns out to be the real killer who forged evidence multiple times just for this case. I mean, I do think it was a great idea to have a character who embodies all of Phoenix's greatest fears for the legal system and showing the bad influence his tactics in Apollo Justice had helps develop why Phoenix has been making the effort to return to his old personality. But yeah, I'll admit they did get way too heavy handed with Professor Means and Moral Mesh like a Pokemon movie. It was pretty funny when he went full on SPARTA mode though. Also, there's quite a few fully voice acted cutscenes, and the voice acting is kind of mediocre. Clive, your Gavin appears to briefly help you out, and his new objection <laughs> voice clip sounds like an overly forceful teenager, doesn't quite fit. And I used to think Juniper Wood sounded like 10 years older than she should have, though on revisit it's not as distracting as I thought. More distracting is that at one point, Hugh O'Connor lets out the most ridiculous and unconvincing scream you've ever heard during what would otherwise be one of the biggest emotional moments of the case. <laughs> you could have cut that scene right before that moment and it would not have been completely ruined. Still, the stuff that's good about the case well outweighs the bad. Even these things feel mostly like nitpicks in the bigger scheme of things. He may have ragged on the whole power of friendship thing earlier, but the dynamic between Juniper Woods, Robin Newman, and Hugh O'Connor was really well done and consistently investing. All three characters are really well developed and interesting, and they really get you to care about them. You may have technically met Juniper Woods before in the intro case of the game, but she's way better fleshed out here. The way that she's trying to become a judge and really holds to her principles. Even initially, she feels stiff and unemotional in her attempts to look more professional, though the facade does crack pretty quickly once she gets arrested. Robin Newman, okay, the twist of her gender reveal you could see coming a mile away, like kid with small girlish physique, brace around chest and androgynous name constantly screaming about how manly he is! No possibility of denial there! It's like a detective who needs to shove his badge in your face every 10 seconds to remind people that he's a detective and not something else. Oh wait. Her girly girl shtick does kind of get old after a while, but the reveal is still great when it happens since she's clearly overjoyed to have it out of her system, constantly teasing and even pretending to faint multiple times. The fainting is not convincing, it's more like she just wants to play into the girly stereotypes for their own sake and overcompensating for having suppressed it all so long, but you do feel happy for her seeing how much fun she's having. And Hugh O'Connor is somehow the most nuts of them all. He acts like a smug, pretentious genius who constantly flaunts his perfect test scores, but the truth is that he is not a genius at all. His parents have been bribing teachers to up his grades, and he even dropped out of school for 7 years and is now actually 25 years old. Maybe that does make the hints of romance a little uncomfortable in retrospect, but they thankfully don't follow through with that. He just cares about his friends a lot, to the point of completely losing his shit in the second trial and making up nonsense about a body double. That was pretty amazing. These three are all red herrings done right. They're all suspicious enough to lead you off the trail, Hugh especially, but you do really care about what happens to them in the end. There is also Miriam Scuttlebutt, who is the Norma de Plume of this case in that she is probably the weak link as far as side characters go, but she's not bad at all. The fact that she spends all her time in a cardboard box for the sake of a one-off Metal Gear Solid reference is kinda gimmicky, and her excessively mean spirit attitude in tabloid newspaper writing can get a little grating sometimes, but it is pretty clear that she just wants to be friends with the others and has her regrets by the end, even she has her likable side. Oh, and let's not forget the reoccurring characters. Clavery's objection clip may not have been great, but that's literally one second. All the rest of his screen time, he's as great to have around as always, and even more openly helpful than before. Since the victim was apparently his mentor, he's got some personal stakes in it. And this is also the height of the dynamic between Blackwell and Fulbright. There's so many hilarious moments with both of them. The moment where Blackwell realizes Fulbright has not tested blood at one point is maybe the single biggest laugh we got in the case. Well, that or an optional moment where he can get Apollo to try and pull Phoenix's hair out. That does really happen. Turnabout Academy may have its issues, but there's just so much fun to be had. It's yet another example of how Dual Destinies is so underrated, and again, we really need more Athena cases in general. But speaking of cases that get undeserved hate... <laughs> 
number 13. 1, 5. Rise from the Ashes. Okay, now hang on. Put down your pitchforks. We're well aware of the criticisms this case usually gets. The main problem with this case is that it desperately needs editing. It's a ridiculously long case, three trials and three investigations, and it is incredibly padded out to the point of feeling unnecessary. Probably the worst example is just in the first third where you have to deal with four testimonies of Angel Star. Like, it, we get it, you have a personal vendetta against the defendant. And dumb moments in the investigations, like where you have to present two different things to her to unlock a talk topic. Why? Also, the evidence law stuff didn't need to be here either. It's basically a once-off device to make the villain harder to take down and make Phoenix look more clever, and is completely ignored in literally all the other cases in the series. And there's that whole videotape part too. Okay, at least that isn't nearly as annoying as the mixing board stuff in 4.3, but you spend a lot of time looking at and listening to that wriggling piece of plywood. And there's other non-padding related problems too, like I'm not really a fan of our defendant, Lana Sky. Oh, I like her though. Like, you can tell that she really cares for her sister above everything else and does some unbelievably crazy stuff to protect her. Yeah, what I don't like about her is the fact that it never feels at any point like we're seeing her for who she really is. She puts on this Ice Queen demeanor that is established by several other characters as not her normal behavior. Even at the very end of the case, she feels stiff and unnatural. Understandably so, and like you said, there is a satisfying arc she goes through, but it still feels like a missed opportunity, sort of. Which sounds really nitpicky now that I'm saying it out loud, but uh, whatever. Alright, fine. But this case is still up really high in the ranking, and that's because I absolutely love it. This case has giant ramifications for the series, and would totally mess the timeline up if not done right. The way it talks directly about Edworth, and how the rumors about his forging evidence came about. Some people say this retconned the arc he had in 1-2 and 1-4, but I think it completes it. Edworth realizes this one case he thought he was clean on, he actually wasn't, and his choosing death is basically him running away from his mistakes, which explains why Phoenix was so mad at him in the next game. Yeah, and for what it's worth, even if I think this case is flawed from a pacing standpoint, I do at least feel like the length matches the case's scope, and most of it does actually feel justified. Like Jake Marshall, for example, you cannot edit out. His arc is integral to the case, and is enjoyable the whole way through. He seems kinda like a jerk at first, but as you go on, the guy really starts to grow on you. I also think the little forensics minigames are a fun addition for what it's worth. The younger Emus guy isn't nearly as fun as her older counterparts, but it's surreal to come back to this case and see how adorable and innocent she is at this age. Surreal in a good way. And of course we gotta talk about Damon Gant. I love this guy. Like, he is so fun-loving and carefree at first, but even from the beginning when he seems harmless, he is still legit intimidating. Despite how nice he seems, everyone's scared of him. Even Edgeworth. And then you unpeel the layers of the fucked up shit he does, and he just gets scarier and scarier. Like the one scene where you're with Gumshoe and investigating his office, and you can almost feel his footsteps creeping behind you the whole time, and it is amazing. He is one of the best villains in the series. I don't see how anyone can deny that. And the backstory with SL9 is one of the creepiest and darkest backstories in the whole series too. It left an impression on me like few others in the series have. I could go on, but the point is, this case is amazing and one of my personal favorites. I don't care what anyone says. Sure, but now it's time for one of my personal favorites. Number 12. 3-3. Recipe for Turnabout. One of the things we like the most about the Ace Attorney franchise is that it can get absolutely ridiculous and over the top in the most enjoyable way. It can make something as serious as a murder case almost feel like silly lighthearted fun, and I think the pinnacle of that has to be this case. Honestly, I have very little to complain about here. There are a few moments where it's easy to get stuck, maybe a redundant testimony or some kind of obscure present topic, and it's still really convoluted and has a ton going on, but it's nowhere near as confusing as, say, the stolen turnabout. There's a ton of side characters you have to interact with, but all of them are totally memorable and enjoyable in their own ways. Be it Old Man Victor Kudo with his excessively detailed testimonies and seed throwing and, ahem, other interests. Or Robot Lady Lisa Basil. Or Creepy Mob Granddaughter Viola Cadaverini. Or let's say 
intensely friendly chef slash aromatherapist slash poet slash pilfer John Armstrong. A lot of whom should be totally obnoxious and grating, but none of them are. Even the victim is surprisingly interesting and memorable. A gambling addicted computer programming genius who has a ruptured eardrum and wears a scouter, I mean HMD. Especially coming after a case when the victim is just generic, rich CEO blackmailer. Glenn Elg is actually pretty fun to look into and find out more about. And of course there's the killer. Almost certainly the bluntest, most obvious killer in the entire series. And that should really be saying something. Well, him or Florent LaBelle. They don't directly show you Tigre's face in the opening cutscene, but you do see his Phoenix-style hair, and he does just say, I'm Phoenix Wright, to your face. So, I don't know, tough call. He screams at you for 30 seconds straight without breathing several times. He pretends to be Phoenix in actual court and somehow convinces everyone that he's the real deal just because he has the same hairstyle. Other killers have intimidated the court before, but this guy just does it by yelling and screaming all the time and scaring everyone but Godot into hiding under their desks. And the way you finally catch him is somehow even better. The case's comedy is top notch all the way through. There's even a whole romance subplot between Gumshoe and our return defendant Maggie Bird that's surprisingly engaging. It may be one of the least serious cases in the series, but that makes it stand out all the better. Going through its colorful cast is among the most fun we've had playing his attorney. Also, Waitress Maya and Waitress Mia are a thing in this case. Enough said. Number 11. Six Two, The Magical Turnabout. So it's finally time to get into the truly greatest moments of the series. This is a case that's pretty short and sweet and straightforward by Ace Attorney standards. Okay, maybe not straightforward. The murder plot here is unbelievably complicated, but it's still short and punchy and not even that hard to follow along. What I like the most about this case is how much they develop Trucy and explore her character so much more than any previous case she appears in. You get to see how much of a perfectionist she is, and how she's so good at what she does that she's got other magicians looking up to her. But she's not infallible, and even kind of cracks under the pressure of being accused of murder and not being sure on whether she really was responsible for what happened leads to one of the biggest tearjerker moments in the whole game, even including the finale, though we'll get to that later. Now this case is also your introduction to Nayuta Sadmahi, and unsurprisingly, he is the weak link in the case. His let it go and move on shtick is a little more excusable since at least it's only your first run through with him, and there is some solid intrigue built with his connection with Apollo. It's a lot harder to swallow in the subsequent cases as we've already run over. But that's about it as far as complaints go. The whole Bonnie and Betty DeFam thing was an interesting little side twist, and even a good solid red herring to distract from one of the most hateable killers in the whole series. Yeah, Roger Rettens really is the kind of guy you really just gotta love to hate. And he just gets more and more hateable with every second he's on screen. Just from the second you look at him and his smug hipster face, you immediately don't like looking at him. Then he starts using a wad of cash as a fan, Charming, and you find out about his crappy tabloid level TV shows and pranks. And he starts talking about how he wants to take down the Grimaris, and then he even freaking threatens you to pay him three million dollars or you'll get rid of your entire office. He's a total dipshit from the ground up, but he's definitely a fun dipshit and a creative one. Oh, yeah. And he's even the real killer, of course. Once we get the personality change into his magician mode, he's not as intensely hateable, just evil looking. But I gotta say, I really like the way they go into his past as the magician Mr. Reuse, and how that all ties in so well with the whole Grimari mess from the Apollo Justice finale. There's even little hints in that case that point towards his existence that you could only possibly notice when you go back and replay that case after knowing the full context. And little hints this case makes towards that game in the Mr. Reuse animations, like how he burns up the Ace of Spades. It's stuff like this that got this case up so high. It's just one of those cases that just has so much care and detail put into it, and you care about all of it. This is really the kind of stuff we love Ace Attorney for. Oh, but we haven't talked about the Apollo Justice finale yet, have we? Why don't we get into that now? Four, 
turnabout succession. Just as most of the bottom of the ranking was intro cases, most of the top of this ranking is finale cases, always among the most mind-blowing showstopper moments of any given Ace Attorney game. This case in particular isn't one of the most well-loved finale cases, but it's one of those cases that just gets better and better every time you play it, and you get to wrap your head around it more. I mean, let's not beat around the bush with what is both this case's biggest linchpin and also probably its single biggest weakness, the Mason System Investigation. This segment is both incredible and also a complete freaking incoherent mess. You get to closely follow Phoenix Wright's exploits over the course of the seven years after his badge was taken away and his investigations of the various details that went into the case that ended his career. You do gotta give them points for originality in terms of presentation, basically in the form of a game in which you basically time travel from past to present and back and play all Phoenix's investigations out of chronological order. It needs to be said that you absolutely should not play the investigation in the order that Phoenix presents to you. You will frequently get stuck and have to rethink multiple times. Wait, what What happened? What, when was this? How does Phoenix know what he knows? What the hell is going on? If you play the segments in this specific order, then this portion of the case flows a lot better and is easier to wrap your head around. You do still gotta do a lot of thinking for yourself on how it's possible that Phoenix has the right information at any given time. It it wouldn't be a stretch to just say things didn't happen in the exact way that Phoenix said they did. Phoenix might have been rigging this trial just a little bit, but it is possible to piece everything together and figure all that out if you really analyze it closely. All the pieces are there in some way. That's why it helps so much to play the case multiple times. Would be nice if that part wasn't presented in such an unnecessarily convoluted way that required so many repeated playthroughs and in-depth thinking to even figure out the real timeline, but whatever. Also worth noting that Apollo himself really doesn't matter at all in this case despite being the finale to the game named after him. This case is all Phoenix. But all that aside, underneath the generally convoluted presentation is one of the darkest, freakiest, saddest, and most downright unsettling cases in the entire series. You unravel the twisted truths of Troop Grimari and how completely dysfunctional they were, be it Valent Grimari's crime scene tampering and hoping to take the rights to his mentor's performance himself, Zack's disappearance in mid-trial, and his return seven years later to pass on the performance rights and finally confide with Phoenix on several other family secrets. Everything stemming with the accidental and death of the last of Grimari, Zack's wife, mother of Trusi and Apollo, and the only daughter of Zack and Valen's mentor, Magnifi Grimari. You also go through Drew's studio and learn about the Forger family, the Mishams, both the deceased Drew Misham, who handled all the business deals and was killed by licking a poison postage stamp, also who apparently was following Apollo pretty closely without his knowledge according to the drawings in his room, and his daughter, Vera Misham, who did all the actual forging herself, including the fake notebook page that Phoenix presented in court, resulting in his disbarment. Also, is immensely shy, never leaves her house, barely speaks at all, and emotes by way of drawing smiley faces in her sketchbook. The kind of person who makes me look like a social butterfly by comparison. You also meet reporter Spark Brushel, who is very honest and reliable, generally nice guy who has a lot of integrity as a journalist, and is also extremely repulsive to look at. Like, just physically. He, he blinks upside down, all his facial expressions and constant movements are excessively creepy, and he speaks mostly impossible headlines and end quote, but he is actually well-meaning. And under all of this is the villain pulling all the strings, lying in wait, and intently watching over those who might expose him. None other than Christoph Gavin. In this game's intro case, you get the feeling that Phoenix has turned into some giant scheming chess master who's pulling all the strings. But here it's made clear that's really just thanks to him thinking about the same case for seven years and out of necessity since he's trying to catch a criminal who himself is doing just as much plotting in the background to cover his own tracks. Kristoff basically killed Zachary for having fired him as an attorney over a COD game. He killed Drew Misham with the poison stamp and almost killed Vera Misham with poison nail polish in an attempt to silence them. 
Really creative murder methods, by the way. Here's the one who originally ordered the forging of the diary page and tipped his prosecutor brother off in an attempt to kill Phoenix's career. And he's so far gone by the end of the case that he's basically forgotten what led him on this massive crime spree leading to one of the best scenes in the case, or even the whole series, where Phoenix is talking to him in his cell, and you can just feel the oozing hatred they have for each other, despite acting perfectly civil to one another. And Phoenix, of course, getting his first run-in with Black Cyclox. Yeah, Kristoff is one of the most memorable and massively creepy villains, if not the most creepy, the series has to offer. Even as you finally take him down with the Jura system, his final reaction is enough to send chills down everyone's spine. Seriously, this case is just amazing all around. One of my absolute favorites to come back to. It feels like they really thought of everything. Aside from presenting all the information in an easy to understand way. Number 9 I 25, The Grand Turnabout. Jesus Christ, this case. This case is so freaking much. But in the fun way, not so much in the density for its own sake way. There's so much to go through with the finale to Investigations 2. But boy, does it end the game with a bang. It's kind of broken up into thirds. The first segment is probably the best part. There's all these kidnappings and Edward has to run around and figure out how to solve them as quickly as he can while running against the clock. Discovering Judge Courtney has an adopted son, the child actor John Marsh, and is being extorted into letting Blaze the Best and Patricia Rowland off the hook. By the way, getting to see Courtney in overprotective mom mode is great and really adds a lot to her character that you never saw before. Anyway, Edworth is also trying to find stolen evidence that would have gotten Roland convicted. Also, Sebastian DeBess has been kidnapped on accident, and Edworth gets to do a very different round of logic chess with him, where he tries to unravel his relationship with his dad and inspire some confidence in him to be able to help culminating later on with Sebastian being the one to take down Blaze himself in court. Oh yeah, and did I mention that the president from the first case has actually been murdered and it happens on a film set where a bunch of the cast from 1-3 comes back and there's some dumb talk about Muzilla and some giant monster must have stepped on him? Yeah, the Mozilla crap was just kinda eye-roll inducing more than anything, though it's not like you can really edit that out. Looking through the film set and finding out what everything means is still pretty cool. What you could have edited down was a lot of heart and Nicole Swift being in complete denial about it. Some important evidence comes out of it that you can't overlook, sure, but there's also superfluous talk about Gordy being back, which absolutely did not need to be there. And not to mention it's kind of jarring and sad to see Lada do a complete backslide in her character here and revert to her personality from 1-4. In the previous case, she'd been trying to expose corrupt dealings as a social justice photographer and felt like she'd come a long way from when we first met her. But now she's trying to prove that giant monsters are real all over again and it's just so stupid. You'd think she'd be over this by now. Yeah, I'm with you on that. But that's just one subplot. It's not that big of a deal in the long run. But anyway, the president's murder, that's a whole thing that needs to be solved. And you have to go into an incident at an orphanage 12 years ago to figure things out. Even if at this point you're no longer running against the clock, and don't have pressure piled up on you in the same way. It is massively creepy to look through in the best way, and Shi Long Lang comes back in a big way as the case is actually really personal to him. He is determined more than ever to find out what happened. He's great here. And what do you eventually find out? The president's fake! The one we met in case one isn't the real president, just a body double who killed the real one years ago and took his place. That actually happened. And from there, you still gotta figure out who the mastermind is. The person who not only killed the president, but had a hand in all the previous cases and manipulated them into happening from the shadows. And that turns out to be the person you'd least expect at that point. None other than Simon Keys of all people. 
who'd previously been established as some innocent guy who needed to be saved, who really is just a massively creepy dude who doesn't trust anyone but himself. And he's even the son of Dane Gustavia, just to tie everything up even more. In terms of surprise killers, he's one of the best, and most unexpected in the series. And getting to finally take him down is fantastic. One more complaint I might add about this case is that I do think they also kinda overdid it on the wrap-up and the morals at the end. After you've caught Simon Keys and have finally proven him to be the real killer and mastermind, there's still a good half-hour material left in the case. Kelly the Killer and Sirhan Dogen pop up last minute with a quick little assassin versus assassin moment, which makes for an awesome screenshot, but then they just stick in that on-the-nose scene with Dogen and John Marsh about how revenge and vigilante justice are not the answer, and then the scene where Edgeworth gets his badge back and talks about how none of this would have happened had Simon been able to trust the system, which, uh... As a side note, the latter part hit a really wrong note for me when the segment was first being written around the summer of 2020 and we were constantly being reminded of the failings of our own country system every day. I was not in any mood to hear Edgeworth go back and say he wanted to uphold the system but change it slowly and incrementally from the inside. But on the other hand, it has been made clear through all the events of this case and just Investigations 2 in its entirety how far Edgeworth is willing to go to rid the system of corruption, and that he's well aware of the limitations of his position. Still kinda wish the ending hadn't been dragged out so much, but I digress, this isn't case ruining stuff by any stretch. This case may generally be kinda messy and tries to pack in way too much. Ima Sky is even there for a solid two seconds and nobody cares. But the vast majority of this case is a ton of fun and totally justifies its length. Even knowing you'd have to spend a minimum of six hours trying to beat it, they continually keep you on the edge of your seat and don't make it feel as long as it really is. As the grand finale to one of the best games in the series, they really went the extra mile in nearly every way and we gotta give it credit for that. Number 8 1, 4, Turnabout Goodbyes This case, like the prosecutor who serves in it, is pretty much perfect. There's so much great stuff in the case that I don't really even know where to start. It's the one with the most intense prosecutor you've ever faced, it's centered around the DL6 incident, the single most impactful event in the entire series by far, it's the case where you get basically the only bit of backstory for Phoenix himself, it's also the case where you question a parrot, and the one where you have to note that almost Christmas means it wasn't Christmas! <laughs> I really don't have any complaints about this case either. You could complain that Von Karma is kind of a one-dimensional villain that's just pure evil and always thinks three steps ahead of you, but I don't know, I kind of find him interesting in the way that he got the insane reputation that he did. The guy had an unbroken stretch of four years with not a single loss and no one ever questioning him. You do not get a reputation like his from nowhere. It's interesting to think about. They've dropped hints that the guy wasn't always pure evil and he was probably even more aggressive than usual here since the case had personal stakes for him, which may have led him to getting that kind of sloppy, but even with that in mind, the tiny mistakes that are his undoing are so minor that you get impressed on how he managed to think of as much as he actually did. Guy is legit intimidating and I don't think anyone can deny that. The other great thing about this case is how it balances tragedy with comedy. It's so well done, you do have all this super intense stuff about Edward's past and how he thinks he may have killed his own father, some of the darkest stuff in the series, and that's really saying something. But you also got a lot of heart and all the Gordy stuff. You got the parrot questioning, as mentioned earlier, and messing around with Yanni Yogi and the noodle shop. He's always been quite amusing, even though it's a total front. But this case has one of the best appearances of Larry Butts in the whole series. The way he just has to run in and save you at your lowest point, even after you've already been given a guilty verdict, only to talk about having heard a gunshot while wearing headphones. And also there was this whole connection with Gordy and having started in the first place, and also the very end with the lunch money. He may be the single funniest element in the case, he's just great. But he's also directly part of Phoenix and Edgeworth's backstory too. Much to their dismay. <laughs> and there's also the whole tasing scene with Von Karma. Sure you're forced to do something stupid to make it happen, but it's the kind of scene that'll get burned into your mind forever once you see it. It's where you and Maya are at the lowest point in the case, 
which is really saying something given how often you feel like you're at the lowest point in the case. Oh, and Maya! She's great in this case too. Not in the same way that she is in something like 1-3, but she has a whole arc where she feels like she's totally useless and hasn't trained enough to channel her sister again. But she just barely does enough to save you from losing, and her backstory is directly related to DL6 on top of that. Yeah, I don't think there's much that needs to be dwelled on for this case. Both of us agree it's amazing from start to finish. I even like Gord Lake as the setting and how it feels kind of miserable despite being in broad daylight the whole time. Only reason it's not even higher is because it's been topped in some ways. Number 7 I-2-3, The Inherited Turnabout Anyways, now that we've gone into the DL6 case, let's get into the one that directly leads up to DL6. Just the premise of this one alone sounds awesome. The case being split up between the present and the past, looking through the final case of Gregory motherfucking Edgeworth, right before his death, and then 18 years later, following Miles Edgeworth, finally solving the case and exposing the truth once and for all. And it just so happens to be one of the most colorful, memorable, entertaining, even downright emotional cases in the whole series. And it's about a freaking dessert making competition. That's Ace Attorney for you. Now, for what it's worth, this case isn't completely flawless. It is rather overstuffed, there's so many details to keep track of, from chemical reactions, to evidence of fake desserts, and fancy fluorescent cloth, and zodiac sculptures, and chilled tea saucers, and everything else. A lot of this stuff ends up slipping your mind because there's just so much you need to remember. I feel like there's enough details in this case to equal that of Turnabout Ablaze, and it's only case 3 in the game. Though at least these details are far more interesting and memorable than those in that case, or even a lot of the surrounding cases. Some of the characters aren't really given much to do. K is there to use Little Thief once, and I honestly forgot that even happened. Larry is there again as Loris, and doing logic test against him is just as hilarious as you'd think. But aside from that, you forget he's even there. And given this is Larry we're talking about, that's really saying something. Judge Courtney and Sebastian the Best are there again, and while they're no longer a direct hindrance to your progress, like in their initial appearances, they're still not particularly fun to be around. Delicia Scones is mostly just kind of creepy, and I'm not sure if that was actually intentional. Even if she's plenty interesting to investigate, and not bad as a red herring. And Dane Gustavia isn't one of the greatest killers we've ever had in the series, even if he certainly has his entertaining moments and is satisfying as always to take down. And it is interesting that the victim happens to be equally evil and corrupt, if not even more so somehow. <laughs> but in the big scheme of things, I'm admittedly really grasping at straws thinking of things to complain about. A lot of these complaints are about elements only being good and not great to amazing. And there's so much more stuff in this case that is done amazingly. Obviously, Gregory Edgeworth himself is the most notable example. Getting to play as him and find out how his mind works is so much fun. The guy is such a likable presence. He may seem to stand by embarrassed when his assistant Ray Shields is singing and dancing with his clients, but in his mind, he's just humming along with the song as well. He's so genuine and innocent with not a hint of sarcasm, but he's also just as driven and determined to uncover the truth as his son is. Oh, and Ray Shields? This case unquestionably shows him at his best, both as the 18-year-old assistant who eats paper and then the 36-year-old present-day version bring Miles over to finally clear up the truth of the case, and even doing more to directly help you besides just standing in the background. Well, he does still kind of stand on the sidelines most of the time, but he does have a much more active role now that we're in a case that's so personal to him. But really the standout element of the case has to be Jeff Masters and Catherine Hall. They may just be side characters who never appear in any other case, but you really do care about them. Their pseudo-father-daughter relationship is absolutely adorable and often heartbreaking. The fact that Masters spent 18 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit, and the lengths that Catherine Hall goes to get him out and catch the real criminal is pretty insane. But it leads to like five different isolated moments in this case, which are just total immediate tearjerkers. Be it Ray Shields offering to defend Catherine at the end in court for what she'd done, or him thinking about how he never got to come home with Gregory at the end of his last trial. 
or Edgeworth giving Masters the chocolates at the very end. And I feel like there's even more there we may have forgotten. This case was waterworks all around and in terms of pure feels, easily beats out the game's actual finale. And from moments like these, to how colorful the setting is and how good the music is, and so much more, it's the best case in Investigations 2 and basically the best side case in the entire series. Well, more specifically, the second best side case. There's one that we marked as a little better. Number six. Two, two. Reunion and Turnabout. Maybe a bit higher than you would expect? I don't even know where to begin talking about a case like this. The introduction of Pearl Fay and Francisca von Karma? The beautifully atmospheric setting of Fay Manor? The beginning where you have to break down a door with Lotta Hart later paying off to a testimony in which you have to confirm everything she says? The middle with learning about the rules of spirit channeling, figuring out how to use the Magatama for the first time, and unraveling the details of an increasingly complicated murder plot while a sense of impending dread builds magnificently? The ending where Phoenix gets whipped a thousand times? I could go on. How about more fittingly we talk about the elements of this case that people would typically find annoying and why we don't agree. Like, Eine Meine. She seems ridiculously out of place, like an annoying airhead that isn't worthy of your respect. When you figure out her biggest secret, her over-the-top behavior actually kind of makes more sense as someone who really resents her place in life right about now. Or what about the whole hmm yes scene? It has to be called the hmm yes scene. This guy is called hmm yes. Anyone watching needs to get it right. <laughs> okay, but in all seriousness, this is still a really entertaining scene. They could have just done some boring talk with a doctor at a hospital, but in Instead, they went the extra mile to making this character who doesn't really matter much in the long run one of the most memorable and funny parts of the case. If also highly creepy at the same time, but th they're self-aware about it. This case gets ridiculously dark with talks of car accidents and malpractice and druggings and the ever-foreboding presence of Morgan Fay. Scenes like this to lighten the mood in some way are always a plus. I can also see a lot of heart wearing out some people's welcome, but I never found her more enjoyable than in this particular case, having that whole existential crisis. And mind you, we're talking about the worst elements of the case here. There's so much stuff to pick apart here, it's all great with no real caveats to speak of, has big personal stakes for lots of mainstay characters, and what puts it over Inherited Turnabout despite not being the same tearjerker that case is, is the fact that it's so much tighter and accomplishes so much more with less. Not to mention much better atmosphere building. Much like 1-4, the fact that this case sticks in your memory so much even despite not being as colorful or popping out as much really says something. Also, Dr. Gray flips you off. Very important. But now it's finally time to get to the top five. Number five. Four, one. Turn about Trump. So, remember how we had like all the intro cases at the bottom of the ranking? One of these is not like the others. Basically, all the other intro cases are something we just feel like we have to get over with. You go through the tutorials again and go through the motions and whatever. They're never that interesting. We don't look forward to them, which makes Apollo Justice all the more of a weird anomaly since the intro is somehow the best part of the whole game. And as we've already gone over, that's not a crack at the rest of the game itself. It's more of a statement on how incredible an intro this case is. Being the start of the second trilogy, this case is all about setting up new characters we've never seen before, and I think the most compelling of these new characters has to be Phoenix Wright. What? I mean, sure, we knew someone called Phoenix Wright who starred in all the other games in the series, but are you gonna tell me that this is the same guy? The pure shock of seeing how drastically different Phoenix is for the first time is just the tip of the iceberg. Coming back to this case after you know all the backstory just makes it several times more potent. 
not just knowing about the full depths of what Christoph Gavin's done, but also just looking at how much Phoenix has accomplished and how he had everything so perfectly planned out to the most minute detail. And on top of that, he actually forged evidence in this case and duped Apollo into presenting it. This is one of those cases that might seem relatively innocent in its opening moments, but just goes further and further down the dark rabbit hole as you go along. Every character in this case but Apollo and Payne really gives you a glimpse of their darkest side here. Most on the nose in the case of Olga Orly, kinda suspicious Russian waitress who isn't actually Russian at all and is actually a professional poker cheater. The tension between Kristoff and Phoenix in this case is the best thing about it. Kristoff as the surprise killer behind basically everything in the game, and Phoenix as the mastermind who's managed to think through every minute detail in how to perfectly bring Kristoff to justice. And somehow, Phoenix turned out to be the scariest one of all of them. Even down to the setting, which is not something you usually care about in these intro cases, taking place in the seedy underground bunker where black market deals used to happen, but also where Phoenix is paid to play poker with people and has never lost a single time. It's surprisingly really immersive too. The one weak point about this case is just Apollo himself. He may be the one you play as, but he doesn't really have any character yet beyond having thrown out his voice. You're otherwise just playing as a plot device, a mere pawn in Phoenix's giant chess game. The game's finale also has pretty much the same problem, even as you realize in that case that Phoenix isn't nearly as organized as he looks, and behind the poker face is the same old guy flying by the seat of his pants and doing what he can to get justice served. 404 still belongs entirely to him, and Apollo is just along for the ride. Same deal here, but at least in this case there's some good dynamics between the two and some good inner conflict for Apollo having to work towards putting his own mentor behind bars, and he even punches Phoenix in the face for getting him to present forged evidence on his first ever trial. A big part of how this case got up so high in the rankings is just our pure shock that it is an intro case, and we don't usually have any high expectations for those. But there's still no denying it's a ton of fun to come back to every time, and still totally freaks us out to this day. I mean, it's so good, the only cases above it are the big, obvious finale cases. So let's get into those. Number 4 Six Five Turnabout Revolution Okay, the one case in which it's near impossible to get through all in one day. Pretty sure this is the longest case in the whole series, it's probably as long as the last two cases in Dual Destinies combined, and normally takes a good 10-11 hours to get through. We've got a lot to cover. So there's two distinct halves to this case. The first half in America, and the second half in Crying. The first half is the weaker half, but it's still pretty great in its own right. You get to meet up with Dirk Sadmahi for the first time and really get to know him and spend a lot of time with him. And he is one of the best one-off characters in the entire series. They managed to make this guy previously established as this super intimidating villain or something just instantly likable from the first moments he's on screen. He does his absolute best to be a father figure to Apollo and to try to make up for the fact that he'd been gone from his life for so many years, despite having raised him as a kid. They go look for the missing Kryonese Founder's Orb down in Karain Village, investigate another murder, go on a whole Indiana Jones style adventure through the mountains, to finally get the orb back, almost drowning in the ocean along the way, and return to find Phoenix suing you on behalf of a politician trying to get the orb in his hands. And yes, Apollo directly facing off against Phoenix in a civil case is just as amazing as it sounds. Phoenix both showing off a bit of his cryptic I have everything planned out personality from Apollo Justice and later just completely floundering and bluffing when he starts to lose. <laughs> it's just so freaking good. That is the first half of this case and the less impactful part of it. There are a few one-off characters that only appear in this half of the case that are not huge favorites admittedly. You got Sarge, aka Army Buff, uh, <laughs> Army Buff, 
fuck you. <laughs> the archaeologist's military-obsessed daughter who constantly speaks to you via a drone, and you don't actually get to see face-to-face -face until the end of the first trial. She's adorable when you do get to see her, but her shit can get a little grating outside of that. And then there's Paul Attition, who... I think I would be a stretch to say I liked this guy. I mean, he has to be the most openly punchable character in the whole series, right from the very first frame you see him on screen. But it's played up to such a ridiculous level from there that he comes around into genuinely hilarious territory. He's the absolute epitome of characters you love to hate, and in that particular way, he was a ton of fun. But then there's the Cryonese half of the case, which is what really gets this case into the top five material. Minister of Justice J.K. Simmons, I mean Inga Kakul Kryne, stages a coup, luring Dirk into the tomb of the assassinated Queen Amara. And then after 20 minutes, we come back in to find Inga dead and Dirk with a blade in his hand. Because, of course. And we go on to uncover every last dirty secret behind the Kryne royal family, behind Dirk, behind Apollo's past and his relationship with Nayuda get completely mind blown by insane plot twist after insane plot twist and watches Apollo bloodlessly and almost single-handedly overthrows the current regime in one fell swoop while he and Phoenix and Ayuda are all literally held at gunpoint and are about to get executed on the spot. At one point, you even get to see Edworth with a dog on his cravat as a bonus. There are still issues with this half of the case, most notably Nayuta is yet again the weak link. They do explain in detail why he acts the way he does and in such a way that is understandable. This is basically the only case in which he feels like an actual person instead of a walking bag of catchphrases. But he's still much too guarded for his own good and he only shows little hints of cracking here and there until the very last minute. We never get to see him for who he really is until the last 15 minutes of the case or so, and at that point it's just too little too late. Additionally, we do have to talk about the big bad, Queen Garon. You may only marginally find her suspicious until the start of the second trial, but the second she switches into her prosecutor outfit, she immediately turns into an over-the-top parody of an evil corrupt tyrant out of nowhere. In one breath, you could easily criticize the case for how blatant of a villain she is from that point on, like, she even gives Morgan Fay's bad parenting a run for its money. But on the other hand, she's still no less blatant a villain than our previous real-life US president. Had this game come out any earlier than it did in late 2016, this could have been a borderline joke, but instead it felt perfectly relevant. And even after that guy is out of office, it's good for the reminder that sometimes authoritarianism is blatantly right there in front of your face. And there is really something to be said for getting to see such a regime completely topple bloodlessly and everything turn out as well as it does in the end. Now that is still only scratching the surface of what this case has to offer. First of all, there's Queen Amara. The rest of the game would have you believe she'd been assassinated years ago by Dirk. But not only did he not do it, of course, Amara isn't even dead to begin with. She's alive and well, disguised as Rafa's old lady servant, Nana of all people. And of course, she was directly involved in Inga's murder and basically handled the entire cover-up herself with the aid of spirit channeling. All the Dahlia, Iris, and Morgan Misty parallels being indirectly explored with her and Garon are a pretty awesome detail. But that's not even close to the biggest twist in this case. Just as someone you thought was dead this whole time was really alive, the opposite is true as well. Dirk had been dead before this case even started, and only got his last chance to make amends with Apollo and Ayuda thanks to being channeled by Maya and Amara. And boy does that revelation hit you like a freaking train. Calling it one of the best and most soul crushing moments in the entire series would be an understatement of the year. And on top of that, we do have to talk about Rafa, who is a massively integral part of the case. All twists regarding her true parental lineage aside, I may have ragged on her a lot and found her annoying and stereotypical in previous cases, but she is way better in this case as she has to process all these plot twists and take abuse from her mother, and she reacts accordingly and very much cracks to the point of not being able to perform the divination seance at all. Her arc is way better done than Nayuta's, and there's even some neat insight into Inga's character through her behavior and how much she innately loved and trusted him as her father. 
there is still something about this case that does leave open the possibility for more to come. It's not like Bridge of the Turnabout, where it feels like we've tied up every loose end for every character in a neat package. There's still plenty more to explore with all these characters. But save for finally being told who his mother is, I think Apollo's own story is done and doesn't need any more development. Finishing with him deciding to stay back in crying to help rebuild their legal system and parting ways with Phoenix seems like pretty much the best note for his character to go out on. It's still an absolutely incredible way to close out this game and only has me more excited for possible future releases whenever that's happening. Still waiting on that, Capcom. And now that we're through that big finale, let's talk about three more. Number three. Two, four. Farewell, my turnabout. Right, the only case in the entire series in which the client you are defending is actually guilty. That's a start. For a long time, this used to be my personal number one pick. I hold this case pretty close to me as the longtime Justice for All defender that I am, and honestly, I'd still put it at number two if this were just my own list. The tension building and suspense throughout this case is absolutely fantastic. You're kept on the edge of your seat the whole time, seeing Phoenix question his own morals and where he draws his lines but is forced to ignore them because Maya's held hostage. It's a really long case that doesn't feel nearly as long as it actually is because of how well that suspense is built. The entire second investigation sequence is one of the best investigation sequences in the whole series as well. There's of course the unforgettable moment in which Phoenix is forced to make an impossible decision. I don't think there's anything I can point to in this case that I don't like to any degree. Maybe Lada doesn't have anything important to do, maybe the whole case has a bit of a celebrity gossip edge to it that might not always be everyone's thing. That's as far as I can go. This is probably Edward's best appearance in the whole series. After the previous cases built him up to have chosen death, he makes a triumphant return, having completed his arc in the first game and come out on top. And you get your first taste of the real badass truth-seeking Edward, who feels like he's constantly on top of things and completely in control at any given point. You want to be on his side so bad throughout this case, even though you can't. He's fantastic. He even completes Franziska's arc too, beating Phoenix right after she had been trying so hard to beat Phoenix herself to have one up on Edward. And Edward even reminds her that's a dumb reason to quit after the credits. And that's not even getting into the characters introduced in this case. Matt Ongard and Juan Carita have a rivalry that doesn't seem like much at first, but as you go on, they just reveal themselves to be completely awful people. Both of them, Ongard hiring an assassin to kill Carita, and Carita fakes someone's suicide note to try and ruin Ongard's reputation. These were things that happened. Caught in the middle of this is other suspect, Adrian Andrews. She seems so stiff and cold and logical on the outside, but in a way that feels weirdly off? And as it turns out, it's a total front. She completely lacks self-confidence and depends on those around her for strength. A lot of depth to her character just in this one case. She's fantastic as well. And of course, we meet the assassin, Shelley the Killer, the only Phoenix Wright villain who's never been caught or face any consequences. A man who values trust with his clients above all else. And if someone were to betray that trust, Perhaps that someone would become the next target. Just hearing his theme song playing while Maya is trying to escape Ongard's mansion sends chills up your spine, reminding you he could be around at any moment. Oh yeah, and you have to question this guy in court. After he implicates Adrian Andrews as his client to help you get a not guilty verdict, you get to make him wonder if you're a traitor. Ever been so freaked out by a two-way radio on a stand? And the recurring characters are great too. Gumshoe is as likable and trustworthy and helpful as he always is. He will crash into a telephone trying to get you evidence. Will Powers is back and just as likable as he always is. Even Adrian in cold mode says he's one of the few completely genuinely good people in the business. Old Bag is here too, here to fawn over the victim, have the most deceptively easy psych lock breaking ever, and completely ruin Edgeworth's afternoon again. This has to be her best appearance in the series as well. And Pearl as your assistant is fantastic as well, probably my favorite appearance of her well, either this or her appearance in the obvious one, but I'm leaning a little more towards this one because she's next to you the whole time.
multiple times, she soaks in every last detail of the case and reacts accordingly, and even helps through her spirit channeling in the most direct way. They were really creative with that too. We could go on and on, but this case is already well loved, and it's well deserved. But I fought for another, much more underrated case that I really think deserves to be just as well recognized, and I want to get to talking about that. Number 2 Five Five Turnabout for Tomorrow I will defend Dual Destinies to the ends of the earth. It's still my personal favorite of the games, and the absolute pinnacle of why I hold that game up so high is this freaking finale. It's absolutely incredible. Maybe a little short for a finale, but I feel like they assume you play this case immediately after the Cosmic Turnabout. I mean, why wouldn't you given that cliffhanger? The two cases, like we said earlier, are one and the same. And this is where all the buildup pays off. I mean, one of the very first things that happens in the case is you going back to Yuri Cosmos and finding out why he lied in court so much. And as it turns out, an international spy was involved. That's one of the first scenes. We got a lot to cover. Yeah, what is there? Athena and Black Hole's backstories, the return of Edgeworth, Apollo butting heads with Phoenix, and of course dealing with a spy himself, the Phantom. There's a lot to cover here. Sure, there are minor things that don't matter too much. Pearl is there for the sake of giving one little bit of exposition. The whole robot takeover thing, which is there to make sure the trial happens in the first place, but it is otherwise just a plot device. Trucy is taken hostage and you don't care as much as 2-4 because you and Aura Blackwell have similar goals. But that's about all I got in terms of specific downsides. I think I'm gonna have to mostly sit back for this one and let him do most of the talking. Good, because I got a lot of gushing to do. I don't even know where to start. So, okay. First of all, there's the UR1 incident. Like, one of the single most gory and downright nightmarish things ever to happen in the entire series. I'd even say the most. Questioning the robot who saw everything is just the beginning of how deep that rabbit hole goes. Because it's quickly followed up by Blackwell doing everything he can to take the fall for the incident. Going through a total confusing mess of a testimony. You even have to swap between using Moon Matrix and just presenting evidence. And he's making sure it's as difficult as it can possibly be. Even while knowing he'll be executed for it the next day on a false charge. As for why he'd go that ridiculously far? Well, the truth hiding at the bottom is that Blackwell thinks Athena may have killed her own mother. And even more points to that being the case as well, like how Athena herself shows five black Cyclops when the topic is first brought up at the end of the investigation. Holy freaking crap! I mean, of course she didn't really kill her own mother, but she was right there in the robotics lab when it did happen, and the real killer even attacked her and she even stabbed them. But then her naive sheltered brain thought, hey, maybe if she uses the machine that assembled robots, she can put her mom back together again. You know, the one with all the drills and JESUS FUCKING CHRIST! They never show it to your face or even directly say what happened, just kind of imply what happened with one quick little picture of 11 year old Athena's blood covered smiling face and let you sit there completely devastated. I stand by it being the single darkest moment in the whole series. Well, there's parts of our number one pick that are roughly equally as dark for different reasons, but this was definitely the goriest. At least there wasn't dismemberment involved there. Like, Jesus! And then Apollo. This is where his arc from both this game and his own game comes to a head. Openly suspecting Athena of murdering Clay Terran and using all of Phoenix's logic against him. There's so much mixed feelings going on here, and he really wants to be able to trust Athena, but keeps finding evidence against her. He wants to be able to trust Phoenix to be able to find the whole truth, 
but still remembers what he was like when they first met, and is not willing to just take any random bluff of, from him because, Jesus Christ, Phoenix, this is not the time for your usual shenanigans. They really pull it off perfectly in how totally conflicted he is and how badly he wants to uncover the truth of how his best friend was killed. It's a fantastic payoff to all this building tension the two had between each other. And the way Phoenix actually convinces him and Edgeworth of what really happens. Just through those little dead leaves and figuring out the real killer's escape route. Looking ridiculous because no normal human would ever think of something so crazy as to leap 20 feet over a 50 foot fall onto an unstable ladder. But wait, wasn't there a spy involved in this case? Someone who's incapable of feeling fear. And just as everyone is letting that sink in, that brings us to the true killer. The Phantom. Holy crap, the Phantom is like the single most intimidating villain this series has ever given us. And that may seem like another bold claim, but just look at what this motherfucker's accomplished and what he can do. Between his total lack of emotion and being able to assume anyone's identity at the drop of a hat, even Phoenix himself just had a mask of him ready. Who knows what he could have pulled off with those other masks. He could have posed as anyone, anywhere, and no one would have been the wiser. It's freaking scary to think about. I mean, throughout the entirety of Dual Destinies, he had been posing as Detective Fulbright of all people, who personality-wise is just the complete opposite of the real Phantom in every conceivable way. Super emotional and clueless and inept at his job, but also trying to be the super likable hero of justice. And his act was so perfect that we even keep falling for him while replaying the previous cases. He was just so likable before. Well, not that we know what the real Phantom's personality is. He's gotten so good at his job that even he doesn't really know who he is or what he's really like. In his own words, he is an endless abyss. Holy shit! And not to mention just how well thought out his plan was from the very beginning. He thought of literally every last detail and was basically only caught by pure chance. Since his bombs only partially disintegrated the moon rock with his blood on it into dust, rather than completely. I swear, this guy makes Shelly the Killer look like a pushover. And his theme song kicks ass. Yes, it does. But yeah, given how many arcs are going on in this case, and pulled off so perfectly, it's one of those cases that you could just play over and over and keep noticing new things you didn't catch before. None of the big reveals lose any of their impact. I'm pretty much entirely inclined to agree. Basically, all the major characters in this game are at their absolute best. Athena, Blackwell, Apollo, Fulbright, even Edgeworth is freaking great, and his appearance goes beyond shallow fan service. Finding out he's chief prosecutor and that he's the one who helped Phoenix get his badge back so quickly so that he could get Blackwell off the hook. But he hasn't lost his touch in actual court either, or his coldness. He'll even go so far as to accuse Athena of having tried to dispose of her mother's body as an 11 year old to her face, which... Yikes. And sure, everyone does get their last happy ending, though they do throw in an extra detail that if you get a game over during the trial, you can get several different possible future realities based on how far you made it into the case. And sure, if you do get a game over, you can still just continue from the last question you left off on. It is still a problem with Dual Destinies being too handledy, but make no mistake, it's definitely not any easier. There are some really tough and complicated testimonies to get through as you'd hope for out of a finale case. There's basically not a single detail in 5-5 that I don't completely love. Every single part of it is done so well and feels like the perfect explosive ending to my personal favorite game in this series. But still, it's just the number two pick overall. The number one pick deals with even more major characters we'd already grown much more attached to by that point. Gets just as dark and twisted and complex and has just as many holy shit moments. And if you didn't already guess what it was going to be well before clicking on this video, yeah, it's pretty obvious. Number one. Three, five, bridge to the turnabout. 
Okay, yeah, predictable choice. But let's be real. Was it ever gonna be anything else? This isn't really a case that we have words for. There isn't a single detail that isn't great or even the most minor of complaints we could level at it. Nothing. It so perfectly wraps up the storylines of basically every major character in the series up to that point and delves into them so in depth in a way that constantly keeps you completely invested. It has an incredible atmosphere that starts out mysterious but slowly gets more and more unnerving as you go along. Or whatever the strongest word that means unnerving would apply. By its climax, it could be outright traumatizing, but in the best way. Every time we replay it, even knowing it'll all turn out okay in the end, we get suckered right back in and question whether it really will be okay. Heck, it's even better and more unnerving when we already know everything that's about to take place. I think it's also worth noting that even despite this case going into quite possibly the darkest territory of any case in the whole series in its second half, and the more serious aspects of this case being easily its strongest asset, this case isn't afraid to be really funny once in a while. The first half of this case is your first opportunity in the series to play as Edgeworth, and just the setup of him being a prosecutor and randomly having to fill in as a defense attorney because Phoenix fell off a bridge and got a cold, it's ab- <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely absurd, but also awesome, and you know you want to see it happen. He even pulls in Francisca and Canadian Judge to boot. No, no pun intended. Sister Bikini is... a thing? She may just be a source of exposition more than anything, but she's still plenty entertaining. They even got the jokes with her name to land by some miracle. And of course, Larry Butts is in this case quite a bit, very much in top form. He saw Iris flying! Even all the fluff dialogue in this case is great. Everyone has something to say about everything. Do make sure you get to hear Larry's story about Edrith's origami and witness firsthand how butthurt Edrith is about it to this day. Yeah, this case pulls off just the right balance of knowing when and when not to be serious and how to get all of it to hit just the right way. But of course, it is the second half of this case that puts it on the top spot. Following Phoenix and getting to discover all the secrets behind the case, and things getting darker and darker as you uncover what's going on with Dahlia Hawthorne and Iris, the beyond fucked up history of the Faye family, and finally breaking Pearl Cyclop, which is... yeah... And don't even get me started on Godot. My god. Even when you can kind of figure out his secret from its preceding case so easily, getting down to the details of what makes him tick, and especially his last couple of moments as he confesses everything and realizes the errors in his own ways. I don't know how someone can't tear up at this ending. Not much else to say. It may be the most obvious choice for the top spot, and there's not really anything to say about it that hasn't already been said. But the hype is deserved. If any case in the series could be considered flawless, it's Bridge to the Turnabout. Best case in all of Ace Attorney. And that's the end of this video. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe, and all the rest of it. If you haven't yet, make sure to also check out the first part of this video where we go through the bottom half of this ranking.